through that particular week's parsha, and you do the parsha every week, and eventually after a year, 54 sections later, you finish the whole parsha. Uh, now, additionally, we actually do this live in Humble, where Dan and Noel are from. Uh, and this is also on a podcast form. If, you're, if you like this class and you kind of like the idea of going through the entirety of the Torah, beginning to end, kind of hearing the whole story really quickly in about an hour, uh, then I would advise, if you're interested, to go to iTunes and download the podcast called The Parsha Podcast by Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, and you can catch up in the previous 17 episodes and hear the rest of them along the way. Okay. <clears throat> so, last week's Parsha, we had the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, of course, are the most well-known verses of the Torah, ten universal mitzvos that actually permeate throughout the rest of the Torah. If you look at the Ten Commandments, it's actually a condensed version of all of Torah. And it's interesting, at the end of last week's parsha, and the beginning of this week's parsha, is you start to get, like, what would be the thing after Mount Sinai, after the Revelations, after the Ten Commandments, what's kind of the most important thing to discuss? And it starts talking about what happens when oxes start goring each other. And it's kind of strange. It deals with kind of Jewish criminal and civil law, and I think it's interesting to note that the most appropriate topic to discuss right after the Ten Commandments, according to the Torah, is criminal and civil law. Now, additionally, there's going to be a change in rhythm and pace here in the narrative. The preceding 17 sections of the Torah, we had a lot of stories, a lot of great personalities. We meet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Egypt, and slavery, and Moses, and prophecy, and Sinai. And now, for the first time, we get... Like, we kind of settle down and start talking about laws and laws in mass. Just as a way of quantifying this, if you take the preceding 17 Parsha sections, and you count how many mitzvot are there, how many instructions are there to do or not to do something, and the total equals 41. So, of course, you had 10 commandments, that's 10 of them, but 41 all told in preceding 17 sections. In this Parsha alone, we have a total of 50 three mitzvos, so much more than the entirety of the preceding sections combined. And when you start reading, you see it comes in rapid fire, one after another. So that's kind of uh, important to note. Uh, and I think maybe the underlying theme of the parsha is how the Torah wants us to treat someone else's money. And it's a kind of a fascinating uh, theme. The most important, now you have Torah, you have Sinai, you have Ten Commandments, you're out of Egypt, you're a nation that's now in its nascent stages. What's kind of the most important thing for you to realize? How Jews traditionally and how the Torah expects of us to treat other people's money. Not our own money, other people's money. And that's, it, it seems interesting that that would be the place to start. There is a Midrash that tells us that if someone has a whole basket full of sins, he's a real sinner, he's just sins everywhere, uh, when... Kind of the, what pushes it over the top? What's the thing? What's the point of no return? That's when someone steals from someone else. And if you remember all the way back in the section of Noah, when the entire world was given a refresh button, the reason, the thing, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, was the fact that the world was consumed in thievery. Additionally, in Judaism, uh, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur... Uh, it's the most spiritual day of the year, right? Uh, and at the zenith of Yom Kippur, at Ne'ila, right when the door is about to be slammed shut on our verdict for the upcoming year, what do we pray? To be forgiven from petty theft. And this is, I think, an inter interesting distinction to see between Torah's philosophy and common understanding. In the Torah's view, there is no difference between a theft of 10 cents and 10 cents million dollars. It's just a different quantity, but the sin, so to speak, the act against God, against God's intentions, is the same. Because the act in itself doesn't matter the scale, but the act is an act. So we look at Bernie Madoff as being a terrible crook, but the guy who takes a few paper clips away from the office, what do they care? Come on, I worked so hard here. I finally, right? Well, that's, come on, everyone does that, right? Uh, but the Torah is very clear that, no, the, the denominations, the scale does not matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is what are the laws, and our adherence to this laws is something the Torah wants to stress from the beginning. Now, also historically, we looked at Abraham. Uh, Abraham, if you remember, we saw Abraham's story 
he had a falling out with his brother-in-law over the idea of animals being muzzled. Abraham and his animals were always muzzled, and Lot, his nephew and brother-in-law, he refused to have his animals muzzled, and that was enough to separate them. It means that it's already kind of been in the philosophy of our religion, even dating back to Abraham, the importance and the stress of being very scrupulous with the notion of someone else's stuff. There's some stories just to add on, because these are kind of the themes of the Parsha. Uh, what about stealing someone else's kind of um, <coughs> unquantifiable things? There's actually laws uh, that dovetail from this Parsha about stealing someone else's sleep. You're in a dormitory, and it's late at night, you want to be a little rowdy, and you're like, okay, well, you know, you're, this is you. You pay for your spot in the dormitory. There's actually halacha that says if you steal someone's sleep, it's one of the things you cannot actually pay back. If I steal your paper clips, go back to the paper clips, and I'm okay. There's some things that you steal, and you cannot possibly repay, and it's a huge deal because you're stealing, which is a very severe sin, and there's no way to rectify it. I heard a great story just to finish off this introduction. Rabbi Israel Salanter, the founder of the Musser movement, one of the titanic personalities of the 19th century. He lived from 1817 to 1883 in Vilna, in Lithuania, and in Germany, elsewhere. Uh, he was once on Yom Kippur. It's actually interesting to make a compilation of the stories about Rabbi Israel Salanter and Yom Kippur, because there's a whole bunch of them. On Yom Kippur, he was in a synagogue that was a packed synagogue. And there were some people who have seats. So what they do, they have seats, assigned seats, they sat by the, sat by the entrance. So Rabbi Salanter walks over to them, the people standing at the entrance, starts screaming at them, you're a thief! Thief? The guy's in Moldavani, on Yom Kippur, the great rabbi comes and says, you're a thief? You're a thief! After he finishes praying, he runs over to the rabbi. What did I steal? <laughs> I was just standing here, I didn't steal anything. He says, you're standing in the only airway for the rest of the people. You don't have a seat, and you said, I'm going to stand over here, and I'm going to inhibit everyone else from having a smooth flowing of air. That's a thief. But that's not material. But that's a Jewish attitude. That we have to be so careful with the items of others, with the even non-quantifiable <coughs> items of others, and it doesn't matter the scale. The scale does not matter whether it's something that's worth very little, something that's worth a lot. Additionally, Rabbi Israel Salanter, he famously said, just like there's a prohibition of seclusion with a prohibited, there's a halach in the Torah that you cannot be secluded for a prolonged period with someone else's wife. Why? Because you may, something may happen, right? There's a prohibition of seclusion. It's not just, uh, and even if nothing bad happens, it's, there's still a prohibition of seclusion. Rabbi Israel Salat has said, just like there's a prohibition of seclusion with someone else's wife, there's a prohibition of seclusion with someone else's money. You have to distance yourself so much from infringing upon someone else's finances, even if it means you can't be in the same room with their finances. So that's one of the overwhelming, or overarching themes of the Parsha. <coughs> uh, more broadly, we learn about the Torah's judicial and punitive uh, philosophy. I think it's very in stark contrast with what we have today, let's say in the West, how the Torah treats criminals, what's the Torah's philosophy regarding rehabilitation. It's really interesting how you read something that's so ancient, yet could be so relevant today to modern, inspired to modern moralities, modern ethics, and even modern, I would say, um, modern policy. You know, in Israel, there's a growing movement to take the religious and judicial philosophy of the Torah and make it the law of the land. That's actually a growing movement in Israel. To say, why do we need to take uh, English common law and make that as the foundation of Israeli law. Let's take Torah law, make Torah law the foundation of Israeli law. And if you want to get a sense of what that would look like, a little sampling, you, a good place to start would be this week's Parsha, because like we said, this is the, set, the, the, the name of the Parsha is Mishpatim. Mishpatim means laws. And it starts in rapid fire. So the first verse says, it's God talking to Moshe, these are the laws that you shall place before them. Now, there's a juxtaposition here between the last thing of the previous Parsha and the first thing, the first section of this week's Parsha. Last week's Parsha ended with instructions to build parts of the, of the temple, to build an altar and to build um, the 
infrastructure for having a temple. Now, a temple is representative of the Jewish people's religious connection to God. And we start off over here with nothing about religion per se. It's more the interpersonal, civil, and criminal relationship that Jews have to have with other people. So why, why would you put these two sections that don't seem to be, you know, have any overlap, why would you put them right next to each other? So Rashi tells us that there's a very profound lesson. So first of all, that the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of, of Judaism, is always placed in the temple. There was a section in the temple called the, the Marble Chamber. And in the Marble Chamber, they would have the convention of the 140 rabbis that would comprise the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. And you say, well, what does the temple, the religious epicenter of Jewish life, have to do with the Sanhedrin, the judicial epicenter of Jewish life? And Rashi says, here's the answer. It means that the Torah's philosophy cannot distinguish between someone's religious life and someone's interpersonal life. For someone to say, I'm going to be a good Jew. I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to follow. I'm going to pray all the time. I'm going to be involved in spiritual pursuits at great length and with great fervor. But I'm going to neglect the way I treat other people because well, it's all about my relationship with God. To the Torah, you're making a grave error. This is a terrible blunder because these two have to go hand in hand. If you want to flourish in your Judaism as a Jew, your relationship with the Almighty, as personified by the temple, you must not neglect the Sanhedrin, which represents the way a Jew has to treat his fellow Jew. So it starts off right away with the law of a Jewish bondsman. This is someone who sells himself into a quasi-slavery for one of two reasons. Either it will be as a result of them stealing and not paying back. So if someone steals, only if someone steals, not if someone damages, someone steals from someone else, does not have a way to pay back. So what we do in America, we throw them in a, in a cage with a bunch of other hardened criminals, and we say that's quote-unquote rehabilitation, when in fact... All it does is foment more criminality. What does the Torah say? You steal, you pay, you pay a penalty, and you're back free to go. This is not a dangerous criminal. We shouldn't make him one. Well, what if someone doesn't have to pay? Well, then they have to sell themselves. It's like the guy who uh, eats from the restaurant and doesn't have anything to pay. They put him in the back and make him wash the dishes. So I think there's, there's kind of two central ideas here in how the Torah views the proper judicial attitude. Number one is that you cannot let things go unpunished. What does that mean? Someone steals, they have to pay back. There has to be a way of making things whole again. And we can't say, oh, this is a minor crime, let's forget about it. Number one. Number two, you have to have proper portionality. You have to deal with a criminal commensurate with what they deserve and also in a way that they will be rehabilitated and not increase the likelihood of future crimes instead to decrease it. So someone to say, oh, I, my, my, my crime uh, led me astray and I suffered, well, that's a very positive attitude for them to have because that will decrease the likelihood of future crimes. So this person is a Jewish bondsman. He sells himself um, for his crime or he wants to make, make some money. So there's an interesting halacha here. What... Uh, so the, his owner, quote-unquote quote owner, because this is not a full-time slave, this is a bondsman, someone who's there for a specific amount of time, maximum of 60 years. So his owner is allowed to, he, he has to work for the owner day and night. So how could he work by day? He works in the field, he, uh, he, pay, he mows his lawn, whatever he does during the day. Well, how does he work at night? So the Torah says that he works at night by, uh, he would marry one of the women as part of this, uh, uh, this owner's, um, his, his a maid servant who works for him and produce babies at night. So there's a very strange halacha, seems a little counterintuitive. So you have a Jewish slave, he's not really a slave, he's a bondsman, and he's allowed uh, to sell himself or be sold for his crime of theft to, a, to an owner, and he is supposed to marry one of the women in that, in that home, in that uh, in, in that. Uh, estate. Not the but, actual family 
No, no. That's right, that's right. But if he is single in his regular life, he's not allowed to marry him. But if he's married, only then is he allowed to marry one of the women, which seems counterintuitive. You would think if he's married, he should not be allowed to marry one of those women in the estate, whereas if he's single, then he should. And the reason is, is that the Torah is very, very scared. The mind is very terrified that this person is going to like being enslaved more than he likes freedom. And this is a common theme in American criminal system, is that we make prisoners, we recreate their attitudes of self to make them feel more at home in prison than in the rest of society. And they end up liking it there. We don't want someone to like it this. Why? Because the idea is when someone is a Jew, they're a slave only to God. They're subservient to God. For someone to be in a situation where they're subservient to another man, that is not desirous. Therefore, we're scared of him anchoring himself with a family, with kids now under this just uh, improper situation and not ideal situation. And therefore, unless he has an anchor outside, a wife and kids outside, only then is he allowed to marry inside. Whereas if he's single, then we want to make sure he has no a new strings attached in his new situation. Now what's interesting here, just as an aside, the term for someone who is unmarried is big gapo, which means at the edge of his clothing which is a strange term for a bachelor. If I could think of a lot of different names for a bachelor, I wouldn't necessarily be in the top ten of my list to say someone who comes big up po with the edge of his clothing. But the Torah is teaching us a very important insight here. What it's telling us is that man, humanity, we have a capacity to expand ourself. Where, and someone who is single, someone who is unmarried, the Torah says this person their world ends at the edge of their clothing. Where their clothing ends, that's likely where their life, the world view ends. Whereas someone who is married and has a family, they have begun the first step in becoming a greater and larger person by breaking apart the inborn selfishness that we all have and becoming more of a larger person because now they have a wife, maybe children in their life. It's interesting, the Torah throws that in uh, as an aside. Now, what happens if the person, this, the Jewish bondsman, after six years, his term is up, he's free to go, but he actually likes it a lot? What's the provisions for that? He has to have his ear pierced, which is a surprising process. Uh, he has to, if, if someone, if the slave, the bondsman, voluntarily signs up to continue this, they have to bring him to the door and they pierce his ear. The reason why they pierce his ear is because this ear that just, you know, the previous chapter heard at Sinai the Jewish people are my slaves, God's slaves, and he says, I don't want to be God's slaves. I want to be this master's slave. That ear needs to be rectified, needs to be modified, needs to be kind of, you have to be reminded of the fact that no, this is an improper situation for you to be. What it's telling us essentially is that we all, all of us have one master. There's one supreme priority in everyone's life. There can't be two supreme priorities. And essentially what idolatry is, where someone says that there's a force or an entity that's of greater importance than God. That's what idolatry is. When someone has a master, a human master, that is incompatible with having a divine master. And therefore, the ear that heard at Sinai, the Jewish people are my people. They're subservient to my dominion, to God's dominion. And this person voluntarily says, no, I want to be subservient to a human's dominion. That ear needs to be reminded of this important lesson. There is a morning prayer that we say every morning in the brachot and blessings that reads, Shalom Asani Avid. Thank you, God, for not making me into a slave. Now, People don't exist as slaves today anymore, thankfully. What's the lesson? Well, what's the meaning? What's the inspiration that we can derive from the blessing of not becoming slaves? And the answer is, is that while we are not slaves to another human, we can be slaves to other things if God is not the top of our priority. If someone says, 
there are things that are immutable for me that I'm not willing to cede, to yield to God to, then according to the broader definition of slavery in Judaism, they would be considered subservient to that, and that would impinge upon their ability to be subservient to God. That's the first thing, and that's, that's just the beginning. That's the first mitzvah out of 53. Let's continue here. What about, there's an inter- interesting here, um, mitzvah comes right afterwards here. And this is not a male bondsman, this is a female bondsman. More specifically, a young girl whose father sells her, with quotation marks, with the intention of getting her married. This is an interesting construct that, at least initially, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. We have a young girl whose father decides to sell her ostensibly that she could marry her new master. That sounds very strange, um, just upon face value. But the sources point out that this was actually a very beneficial institution. Um, Number one, the Talmud stresses that even in antiquity, where such a thing was was possible or was maybe even prevalent, there was a prohibition of a father marrying off his daughter before she herself can make that decision. So why would they do that? It seems to be strange. If, if, if it's against the Torah's values for someone to marry off his daughter before she has a chance to make her own decision, why would this possibility even exist? So the commentaries say that there were certain times in, in history, in our history, where young, unmarried women were fair game for any marauding conquistadors or lords or people who had the power to just seize people at will. And this was a major problem. You have your, your, your daughter, you, you're scared of letting her out by herself because some local feudal master can just seize her and there's nothing, you have no recourse, no recourse whatsoever. So what they would employ is this methodology. They would get her quote unquote married as a young girl, and that would be a way to ensure that she'd be safe uh, under such terrible and extenuating uh, conditions. So that's that's the next law. And finally, we start talking about murder and manslaughter. But it's interesting that, go ahead. Go ahead. No, they but respected it's, that it was a girl that was taken, but they didn't respect that they were intermarried. Mm-hmm. So, it, like, protected the community. Yeah, and it, it's it's tragic for us to think that such that such communities right. exist. But learn your history. Even recently, like you say, even yeah, recently, yeah, this it's right. unbelievable, it's terrifying, and we have here a way to prevent it. Yeah. Uh, so, for someone to read the Torah and say, "Oh, the, the Torah is encouraging people to sell their daughters to slavery at a very young age," that's not the intention. That's just a misrepresentation of the uh, of the idea here uh, brought down. The next thing it talks about here is murder. And it's interesting. The Torah is very unequivocal. In the first verse, someone who strikes another man and kills him, he himself shall be killed. What if someone murders unintentionally by accident? Then they have to go into uh, they have to go go into exile. They have to go to city of refuge. Now, the commentators point out Sources talk about this, that murder is the worst sin. And that we know that as instinctively, right? It's the one sin. There are a, a list of, a very short list of sins that even repentance that can absolve everything cannot absolve. Because if you murder someone, there's no way you can bring them back no matter how much you repent. But you can't possibly undo that. But moreover, here it talks about accidental murder. And even accidental murder is punished. And the question is why? If someone murdered accidentally, well, it was an accident. How could they be blamed for actions, for activities that they didn't do willingly? And the answer is that even if it was an accident, typically that accident was born out of carelessness. When someone wasn't being aware, being cognizant, uh, having vigilance to prevent accidents, 
accidents are more prone to happen. So someone is saying, I don't want to disrupt my life and be wary and care and ensure that others are safe. And he kills someone, says the Torah, you didn't want to disrupt your life. We're going to disrupt your life. You don't have to pick up your family, your house, your, every, everything is going to move to a separate city and have to live there uh, for the duration of the sentence until, uh, until you can come out of there. Uh, and I'm saying, I think this is, this is terrifying, this, uh, how seriously the Torah takes murder, especially in, li- in light of the fact that uh, in antiquity, we look at murder as being very bad. Our society, and that's a good thing, thankfully. But in ancient times, it was common practice. Petty criminals would be killed. You don't like what someone says to you. Someone embarrasses you. Let's have a duel. Like That happened in America in recent times, relatively. Torah makes it very clear. Murder, murder is the worst sin, and even accidental murder is punished, unlike other sins where accidental sins are usually not punished. Moreover, if someone is a murderer, but they're in the middle of doing worship on the, uh, on the temple, so the next verse tells us, from on top of the altar, you take him to execute him. Which means, we even disrupt national Jewish life. This is a Cohen. A Cohen's a murderer. But he happens to be in the temple, and he's doing work that's necessary and vital for the entire nation. It says the Torah, you, dis- you stop it. Even if it causes a lot of technical problems for the entirety of the nation, you stop it because this person has to be stopped right away, and we have to take him out, we have, to, uh, we have to treat him for his horrific crimes right away. Next thing, someone who's, who hits his father and mother, they shall die. This is something that I don't think our society is uh, at all aligned with. According to the Torah, if someone strikes his parent, father or mother, that is an executable offense. That is offense that's worthy of them being faced with capital punishment, which is unbelievable to us. Now, important to stress, this is only a wound that actually draws blood. But the Talmud even has discussions. What happens if the son is a physician, son's a surgeon? Can he give surgery to his father? Because he's giving him a wound. Ultimately, Talmud concludes that he can. But this d- does show how seriously the Torah looks at uh, a relationship with one's parents. The Talmud points out that uh, there are three partners in every human, father, mother, and God. It equates parents to God. And that, I think, is something that our society maybe has forgotten. You know, we like to embrace the Ten Commandments, the, our universal principles, but we see how strictly and severely the Torah looks at uh, how we have to honor our parents. If you strike your parents, that is an executable offense. Very, very striking, very powerful uh, idea. Next law. Someone who kidnaps someone. That's an also executable offense. Thankfully, that's not so prevalent. Someone who curses his father and mother. Now, this, of course, to be, this doesn't mean to say a, a word that has to be bleeped out under FCC regulations. It means a specific kind of curse of a parent. It's invoking God's name as part of a curse. But this does show, again, the severity that the Torah views when, uh, when it treats, uh, how we're supposed to treat our parents. Next law. Uh, someone strikes someone else, but they're not, they don't die, but they're actually kind of ill, and we're not sure will they die or won't they die. This is an interesting law, because this is the only time in the Torah where, uh, where incarceration as, uh, as a method of judicial process is used. When someone strikes someone else, and the person is now in a coma, we don't know if they're going to die or not, the, uh, the agitator, the uh, uh, the perpetrator is going to be put in incarceration to see if the person dies. If the person dies, then they could be executed. If not, they're let go, provided they pay for the medical bills of the victim. Additionally, this is in a very important law. This talks about a full-fledged slave. Now, I don't want to debate the merits of slavery aside, but we do know that in history there was slavery, and the Torah governs that as well. And it actually says, and this is surprising, uh, certainly, if ha- anyone has familiarity with American slavery and the, and the rights that the slave master had over the slave, the Torah here says if a slave master strikes and kills their slave, the slave master themselves, the owner, can be executed. 
What this means is that slaves under Jewish law were actually treated with the full rights of any citizen. If a, if a, if a, uh, if they get stricken, they get struck by their master, they're going free. If they get killed, if they get killed by, by God forbid, by their master, they, the master themselves, gets executed. What it means is that these people were given the full rights of full citizens, uh, even in antiquity. Pretty interesting. Uh, next law. Uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a leg for a leg, etc. It continues, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, and a, and a bruise for a bruise. Uh, parenthetically, uh, Trump said in uh, one of the debates that he loves the Bible favorite book after Art of the Deal. Well, what's your favorite passage? An eye for an eye. That's his favorite passage. Um, but what does an eye for an eye actually mean? Um, there is another verse that says, a life for a life, if, I, if, if my animal kills your animal, I have to pay a life for a life. What does that mean? Does that mean that I get killed for my animal killing your animal? No one suggests that. And that is, in fact, used as evidence that when the Torah says an eye for an eye, it does not mean wanton revenge. Someone, God forbid, strikes the eye of another person. Their eye gets gouged out. That's not the Torah definition of this verse. That's the literal definition of this verse. But if you read a little few verses later, it says a, a, a soul for a soul. When my animal kills your animal, no one suggests that I get killed for my animal killing your animal. But that is informative that every time it says this for that, an eye for an eye, a wound for a wound, a bird for a bird, etc., what it actually means is I have to pay monetary payment. Uh, now, I think in broader society, in common parlance, an eye for an eye is a code word for revenge, which means if you hit me, I'll hit you back. You take my eye, I'll pick your eye. And that's a little bit of a mistake because the Jewish philosophy of judicial process is not to have an unnecessary revenge, rather it's an act of rehabilitation and of fairness and of justice. The Torah does not believe in just wounding someone just as a way of getting even with him. It's not our job to make things fair, that's God's job. God has his way of dealing with revenge. It's not our job. And the Jewish courts and the Jewish judicial jurisprudence is not oriented about just exacting revenge after, uh, uh, as a result of, uh, of activities of people. Uh, next thing, if, a, if an animal, God forbid, kills a person, a human, so the animal gets killed, and if it happens multiple times, then the, the owner has to pay a very large penalty, the penalty equivalent of the value of a human. Here the Torah is stressing that our responsibilities to our fellow include monitoring and guarding our property that our property should not injure or hurt someone else. I am responsible not only for my actions but for the actions of everything under my stewardship. If I have an animal, I have to guard it. If it goes out, I am liable uh, for it to be, uh, it's, it's, it's on me, it's on my head. And in fact, the way the Torah even uh, orients, the way, it, the way it frames this punishment is that I am guilty, I have to be killed. If my animal kills someone else, I have to be killed, but I could pay my way out by paying a penalty. Which means is that ideally, you have to realize that the actions of your animal that it can have to injure someone else, that's really on your head. Yes, of course, you won't get killed for it, but you should be wary and be aware of how stringent it is viewed. Moreover, what happens if someone places a, uh, a pit in, in public thoroughfare? Halacha is, Torah says, if I have a pit or some sort of obstacle, everything that happens for that is liable, I'm liable to pay. And this is, I think, again, another stage of the Torah's jurisprudence. And that is that I'm responsible not only for myself and for the items that I'm responsible for, but I'm responsible for everything that can be deduced from my actions. I cannot say, I do something and there it's my action is limited, it's fixed. Uh, it's kind of limited to the scope of the act itself. No, says the Torah, my actions extend to all the permutations that are deduced 
from that action. I make a hole, it causes damage in 10 years from now, that's on me. Well, why? I, I did the action so long ago. The answer is that no. You're responsible for your actions and also what your actions beget. And that's, by the way, a good lesson more broadly. If I do a good action, I do a mitzvah, and that mitzvah actually has a domino effect, and that causes 10 more mitzvahs, which causes 100 more mitzvahs, which causes a million more mitzvahs, all that can be reattributed back to me. Because the Torah, in both good and bad, looks at the results. Right there? It's up from there. Sorry about that. Um, that, that was just a drill. Yeah. The, the Torah looks at the results of an action and goes all the way back to its source, both good and bad. Which means if I encourage someone who's having a bad day and is considering to jump off the roof and I encourage them and they kind of get, that's the little inspiration that I give them. And that gets them back on their feet and then they have a family and they have a business and they do good things, all those actions could be attributed back to me. And the converse is true as well. This, this does, of course, amplify our responsibilities in life. Because what we think as being maybe very minor, it's like you drop the, the banana peel on the ground. I think it's kind of minor. What did I do, right? But everything that results from that action is attributed back to me. And that's, of course, a negative side. But the positive side is overwhelming. If I inspire a young child, and, I, and that leads to something which leads to something else, everything is written or is brought back to the originator. If I, if I write a book that inspires someone and that sends them along a path of goodness, all gets attributed back to me. It's just amazing. This is like the power of compound interest. It's just, it's unbelievable how fast and how rapidly it can, uh, it can perpetuate, it can disseminate. Okay, so let's continue here. I'm trying to do this very fast because there's a lot. I want to get to all of it. In verse 37 here, it tells us, if a man steals an ox or a sheep or a goat and he slaughters it or sells it. So I have to pay plus a penalty. What's the penalty? I have to pay five cattle instead of the ox and four sheep instead of the sheep. So I'm paying a penalty either four or five times what I stole if I, if I slaughtered it or sold it on. Now, there's obviously a discrepancy here. How come would I have to pay five times for the cattle, but only four times for the sheep? So Rashi explains that the Torah is careful for the shame of the criminal. Why? If I go into someone else's barn, and I take their cow. So how do you transport a cow? You have to walk alongside it. But if I go take a sheep... How do I transport it? I have to lift it. I've got to walk through town holding the sheep on my shoulders. And that's kind of a demeaning and degrading and embarrassing experience. Says the Torah, because the criminal had to suffer along the way, their crime is not as bad. That diminishes from their crime. And therefore, their penalty is also diminished. Which is pretty impressive, the, the, the idea that the perspective and the attitude of the criminal. This is the criminals. Why should we? Well, who cares about them? The Torah is saying we care about them, and therefore we're, we're going to take into account not just the result, the bottom line of the action, but also everything that was necessary along the way to bring them to that point. All that is taken into account. They suffered by doing the crime. They got part of the punishment already. They got part of the punishment. We're going to deduce it, uh, uh, reduce it from. It's from the ultimate result. And I think, of course, this does extend more broadly. We think about a mitzvah as being a mitzvah. And kind of, a mitzvah is a mitzvah is a mitzvah. They're all, they're all the same. And conversely, a sin is a sin is a sin. Mishnah tells us, lefum tsara agra, which is a nice little bumper sticker, lefum tsara agra. Most people won't know what it means. But it means, as per the pain is the reward. It's in Aramaic. As precisely per the pain is the reward. Talmud elaborates and says, someone who does a mitzvah, it's easy. Well, that's one unit of value for that mitzvah. Whereas that same exact act that was done out of pain, that's worth a 100 units more. 
which means that not all mitzvahs are evaluated equally. The Torah takes into account everything, the Almighty takes into account everything that is, that is part of an action. If an action was more difficult, then even though it's the same action to us human observers, but God treats it differently. And that's, I think, very inspiring to note that the Almighty is keeping store and keeping track of everything and nothing is lost. Next thing, self-defense. What happens if you have someone who is intruding upon your house? You have a home intruder. What to do then? So people would think, well, the Jews would just wheel just draw like sheep to the slaughter. Absolutely not. Uh, chapter 22, if a thief is several while tun- tunneling in, and you strike him and you kill him in self-defense, castle law that we have in the United States, in most, in most states, and you kill him, there is no blood guilt on his account. The Torah is telling us, and the way it's conceptualized in the Talmud, Habala Hargacha Hashkeim Lepargro. Someone who comes to kill you, you kill him first. There's a principle here that's being conveyed, and that is that we do not turn the other cheek and say, Come hit me again. We say, No, we're going to hit you before you hit us. If someone is coming into your house, you are allowed to, maybe even required, and an observer as well, to stop them even if it means killing them, because that is your responsibility as a Jew, and that is, you have to, you will have to uh, self, uh, engage in self-defense. I saw my grandfather, blessed memory, he once uh, was asked what to do when you have two brothers that are fighting. So, it's funny, I showed this to my wife, and we actually kind of got a kick out of it, because I always told my son, I had two sons that I liked to fight a lot. Shocking, I know. They would fight, and then one brother, one, the older brother would sit and take it. I said, no, you hit back. And he took it literally. So then I get, I get, I get letters, which is okay. I think, it's, I think it's right. I don't want him to sit there and say, my dad told me I have to just observe it. No, defend yourself. I got a call from school. Um, your son will go unnamed. He's hitting kids. So I say, what's the deal? He says, well, he, he tells his teacher, my father told me, if someone's hitting me, I hit him back. <laughs> and you know what? I agree with it. Problem is, he started going on the offensive, which that's when things got problematic. But it's a very powerful lesson. We have to teach our kids that if someone's coming after you, you have to defend yourself. Maybe the Talmud does say, the Talmud does describe the greatest, I, the greatest heroes, people that are publicly ashamed and don't do anything about it. Those people are like Moses, and they go into Olam Abba. That's not for a five-year-old. A five-year-old needs to know if someone comes after you, someone's trying to kill you, kill him first. If someone's attacking you, you fight back. Hit him twice as hard. That's, that's the appropriate thing, and that's proper parenting. And by the way, I was actually <coughs> heartened to hear that because I had advised as such before I saw this because it made sense to me, and, and now I got confirmed that that's what, indeed what is, what, is, what is appropriate. Okay, so someone comes into your house, you kill him first. Uh, however... The exception to that is if you know for certain that they are not coming with nefarious intention. No, we have till uh, 220. Right? Mm-hmm. This is a long... Yeah, this is a 220 class. Yeah. Yeah. But don't worry about it. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. So, if someone comes to someone else's house and steals something from him, so, like I said, if the homeowner is there, they're allowed to kill them in self-defense. Why? Because there is a risk that this person is coming with nefarious intentions. They may actually wind up killing the homeowner. The homeowner has to defend himself. Uh, what if he comes and he steals? The general rule is that someone who steals has to pay double. With the exception of someone who steals an animal and sells it or slaughters it, they pay double. Next law. Someone who has... Uh, a, a fire. So you have a little campfire. How lovely. Fantastic. You, like, like a general principle, you're responsible for everything that you start. And if that goes and spreads and, God forbid, uh, causes a lot of damage, you have to pay top dollar plus a penalty. Uh, additionally, the laws of a watchman. What happens very... And by the way, all these laws... There's entire books of the Talmud that very, very intelligent people spend years laboring over. These are just kind of the highlights, just, just the, the cliff notes, the little snippets of these laws, because this is just the theme. We're trying to get the theme of, of the parsha and some of the attitudes, but the details are myriad. So if I hire a custodian, someone to watch my, so four different types of custodians, I give someone something to watch, you know, here's my 
uh, here's my passport and some money and uh, my phone, watch it for free. That's one custodian, an unpaid custodian. There's a paid custodian, I'll pay you. There's someone who borrows something. Someone goes, hey, I want to borrow your lawnmower. Can I borrow your lawnmower? Well, he's actually getting benefit without paying anything for it. And then there's the rent of four custodians. And all these are hinted very quickly in these verses in chapter 22. So if I give my neighbor money or vessels to watch, it, it gets stolen. This is an unpaid custodian. And therefore, because they're unpaid, they're not liable for theft. So I give someone, hey, watch this for me, and someone breaks into his house and steals it, then uh, he's not liable. However, what if there's the concern, maybe there was no theft. Maybe the guy just pocketed my stuff, and now I'm left out in the dark. So the truth is, he has to swear, the custodian has to swear that he did not... Uh, extend his hand upon his fellow's property. That's one kind of custodian. If there's another custodian who uh, is paid, then it depends. If it was stolen or if it was lost, then, then one law, law would apply. Uh, versus if it was, you know, uh, someone came in with a gun to his head and said, give me the stuff, give me the property, then that would be a different case. And of course, negligence with the case where they'd be most liable. And there's many, many details of this, and it's just interesting to see the Torah is thinking about every possible situation that may, uh, that may happen. Um, I want to look at here another law that uh, talks about a seduction. So a man seduces a girl who's unmarried. What happens then? Um, they sleep together. So the halacha is that the man is liable, provided the girl wants, to marry her. This is an interesting thing, because the way this is sometimes portrayed by people that are enemies of Torah is that Torah forces a, a woman to marry her rapist. That's how it's presented. Um, and that's, of course, people are being dishonest and disingenuous, because what this is actually saying is the woman has the options, provided she's interested, to demand that the husband marries her. And actually, in the case of a rapist, what would happen? Think about it. In ancient times, a woman would get raped, God forbid, tragic, right? But now she's, she's, uh, she's uh, used goods, right? She's, uh, she's less desirous to someone. But if the rapist is forced to marry her, and by the way, is not allowed to divorce her as well, that gives her insurance. And that also reminds the rapist, don't do that because you may be on the hook to take care of this woman for the rest of her life. And she would be able to extract the full marital uh, performance from him, including taking care and paying for everything for the rest of his life in a Jewish court if he makes the ill-fated decision to do that. So it's actually the opposite. It's actually an ordinance in place to prevent such activities and to give the rights to the victim. Now, the Torah here transitions here into laws that are very kind of ethically and morally powerful uh, and also a little bit terrifying. It says, don't taunt or oppress a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, the word stranger in Hebrew is a ger, which can also mean a convert. There's a special mitzvah for someone to not mistreat or maledict in any way uh, a, the, the people that are less fortunate in the community. Uh, and then the next thing it says here, um, you should not cause pain to a widow or an orphan. The people that are on the lowest level, so to speak, in, in self-esteem, people that are most vulnerable are the ones the Torah has a specific mitzvah to not cause any pain. What happens if someone causes pain to the orphan or the widow? If you dare cause him pain, exclamation point, i.e., don't do that. If you do, what happens? For if he shall cry out to me, I shall surely hear his outcry. My wrath will blaze, and I shall kill you by the sword, and your wives will be widows, and your children Orphans. What this is telling us is the Torah treats us tit for tat. If I cause pain to a widow or an orphan, God forbid, that means that the perpetrator is liable for his wife and his children 
to experience uh, such pain. Really terrifying uh, indeed, really scary. Next law here. If you shall lend to my nation, don't lend with interest. So this is the mitzvah uh, that we should give interest-free loans. It's actually a mitzvah in the Torah to give loans to someone else, and it's actually one of the best ways to do charity. In our society, we like giving things for free. Uh, kind of the ch- charity has been kind of moved at, to a government program to give free, uh, freebies. But that's the meaning. Because the person feels like they're, uh, that they're reliant on other people. It's not a good feeling. But the best way to give charity is to actually help someone get back on their feet with dignity. And one of the best ways to do that is with an interest-free loan. It's a loan. They're going to pay it back, God willing, when things get better. And even if you must take a collateral, the verse tells us, you take a collateral, you have to make sure that you do not take something that's too vital for their life. So the example that he gives in the verse here, if you take your fellow's garment as a security collateral, until sunset you shall return it to him. What this means is, let's say you borrow, you, you lend money to someone, they went through hard times, and you say, okay, well, I want to have some sort of security guarantee that you'll pay me back. So, okay, let me, let me have your blanket. That's the only thing he has. Says the Torah, you are allowed to harbor that blanket until my time. Every night, you got to give it to him. Why? For it alone is his clothing. It is his garment for his skin. In what shall he lie down? So it will be that if he cries out to me, I shall listen, for I am compassionate. This is teaching us. We have to be compassionate to those that are less fortunate to us. If you, even, if, even if you're giving someone a loan and you're only demanding the bare minimum, a collateral, you cannot disrupt that person's life. You give it to him the blanket at night, take it back in the morning. Moreover, if you don't and they cry out to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen for I am compassionate. The Hebrew word used over here is ki chanun ani. Chanun has the same roots as chinam, which means free. What this means here, this is a powerful idea, more broadly applicable, is that if this person cries out to God, I will listen, says God, because I am compassionate, which also means I am free. Which means that prayer has no preconditions. God delivers, listens, answers prayers even if the person is not meritorious, even if the person does not deserve to be answered, they're not someone of great character or great piety or great deeds, someone really wonderful. No. God's going to listen because God is compassionate and God gives out freebies. And this is a very powerful idea. We say in the Ashrei, Karov Hashem Lechol Korav, God is close to all those that call out to him, provided they call out to him truthfully, with sincerity. What this means, everyone who cries out to God is close to God automatically. Well, what if they're not righteous? The act of calling out does not, God doesn't distinguish between someone who's, who's a tzaddik, who's righteous, or someone who's wicked, or someone who's, who's a rasha. In fact, the Talmud has a whole discussion about a thief who's practicing and concocting a heist to steal, and he's praying to God. And you think about that, those two don't seem to be compatible. How could you be stealing, going deliberately against what God says to do, yet be praying to God simultaneously? The answer is that God does not distinguish. Prayer is man, man is, as in mankind, beseeching God, entreating upon God. And that does not distinguish between whether they deserve it or not. And I think it's a very powerful lesson for us. You know, I think one of the things that we will, uh, well, the Talmud suggests that some of the things that uh, after a person dies, the thing that they're going to have the most regret is that they didn't properly utilize prayer. Think about this. You have a red telephone with you at all times with a direct line to God. Provided, of course, you use it with sincerity. And, you know, we like to, I think about, you know, the powerful lobbyists who could lobby Congress or lobby the president. We could lobby God. God doesn't have term limits. And God does not limit it. There's no checks and balances. And we could 
at any time just talk to God. What a powerful medium to affect our life and the life of the people around us. But unfortunately, it's neglected. And here we're told, you don't need to be righteous. Even if you're not meritorious, you to pray and you to be listened to. You could be hearkened to by God. What a powerful tool in our arsenal. We get to heavens after we die and we're like, oh gosh, I had the winning lottery ticket. And instead, I didn't cash it. I didn't utilize it. I didn't maximize my opportunity that was given to me just by dint of me being a human. It doesn't matter. I don't have to be meritorious. I don't have to be righteous. God is free. God has no preconditions to prayer. Very powerful insight. We should try to maximize it as much as we can. Uh, now it does pivot here a little bit into some laws of the judicious, judicial system. So first it tells us that we cannot curse a judge uh, or God, alternatively, depends how you understand that verse, or the leader. We have to have respect for our leaders. And then it says here, uh, don't accept a false report and do not extend your hand to the wicked to be a false witness. So what does it mean a false report? Rashi says, false report means Lashon Hara, evil talk against another person, or for a justice, for a court, to hear the judicial arguments of one side in absence of the other side. There's a prohibition in the Torah to listen to the argumentation of one side without the other side present. And it's interesting, the word the Torah used for this, this is a false report. Now, it's a little bit of a problem because the laws of Lashon Hara mandate that the information has to be true. If it's not true, it's not called Lashon Hara, it's called Moti Shemra, it's a different classification. It's interesting here to note the Torah's definition of true and false are not what we technically call true and false. If I say, look at that guy, he's a he evades his taxes. If that is not technically true, it's not Lashon Hara. It's something else. I'm libelous. I'm Moshe Shemra. If it is technically true, then I'm accepting a false report when I accept it. Well, it's not false. It's true. The answer is yes. It's not. It's true technically, but it's false because you're doing something against God, God's intentions. The, the Torah's parameters of what's true, what's false, is what's correct and what's incorrect. True is what's correct and what's proper. Incorrect is what's improper. Going back to Genesis, we read about uh, Sarah. Sarah's 90 years old. She hears a report. She's going to have a baby. She starts laughing. How can I possibly have a baby? My husband is 100 years old. He's too late. And God tells Abraham, why did Sarah... Why did she laugh? Why was she making a mockery? Why did she say, how am I going to have a child? I am so old. And you actually notice these are verses that are right next to each other. Sarah didn't say, I am so old. Sarah said, Abraham is so old. So why is the Almighty switching? What happened? The Almighty's stamp is truth. How could the Almighty say something which is not true? And the answer is, the Almighty is saying something which is true. When you have a wife and a husband and you have information that can cause disruption in the family harmony, the true thing is to not tell that out. You don't tell the husband your wife said, you're so old. You don't say that. That's false, even though it's technically true. The true thing to say is, if you have to say this for whatever reason, is that, well, Sarah said she's so old. Oh, at least Sarah's not maligning Abraham's age. At least you won't cause marital discord. What's true, what's false by the Torah standards are what's proper and what's improper. There are even guidelines in the Torah. Talmud brings guidelines of when someone is supposed to lie. You know, I'll give an example. I, uh, this is, of course, an extreme example. But the Nazis come looking for Jews. Well, I gotta say the truth, right? Well, actually, go look in the attic, right? No, of course not. No Jews here. Obviously, that's a very extreme example. But the Talmud does say if someone it was a great Torah scholar, and they ask him, well, how many, how many books of Talmud have you already studied? He's supposed to lie. That's the proper thing to do. Ah, a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there. Where do you go to school? Ah, some school back east. Don't say Harvard or Yale. You don't need to toot your own horn here. There's, there is a proper way of, of not necessarily saying the technical truth, because what's true, what's false by the Torah standards is what's proper and what is improper. 
And there's a fascinating law here uh, that comes right after this. Oh, by the way, additionally, just before I forget here, what if you're a judge and you have a really rich person on one side and a really poor person on the other side? It says the Torah, do not pervert the law in favor of the destitute. Your job is to do justice. Don't try to rectify, so to speak, God's misdeeds. Like you say, oh, God did something unfair. He gave this person so much money, this person so, so little money. Don't say, oh, I'm going to skew my opinion in favor of the less fortunate. No. The Torah does not believe in it. We believe in charity, of course, but we don't believe in the fact that our law, which comes from God, is up to us. It's fungible. We can decide where, you know, who to advantage because of our own decisions. And in a sense, I would suggest that if someone wants to skew God's law in favor of the less fortunate, they're essentially declaring that this person became less fortunate not because of God. Because if someone says, I'm going to skew the matter in favor of the poor person, what they're essentially saying, it's not fair. God would want me to do this, right? God himself cannot do it. That's what they're implying, which of course is very dangerous. Now listen to this law. You have your enemy, and they have an animal laden with cargo. It says the Torah, you have to try to help, uh, you have to help him unload it. Don't say I'm going to ignore it. Moreover, the Talmud stresses, Talmud deduces this from this law, from this verse. Suppose you have two animals. Uh, one animal it belong, One animal needs to be unloaded, and one animal needs to be loaded. So which one of them do you give priority to? Obviously, if you have an animal that has a huge load on it, to relieve the animal's load is more important than to load up the new cargo on, on the animal. So generally speaking, to unload takes priority over to load. However, let's say you have your enemy's animal needs to be loaded, and your friend's animal needs to be unloaded, well, then you load the enemy's animal before you unload your friend's animal. And the lesson is here, the Torah wants us deliberately to try to help the people that we don't necessarily like. We don't want to have a situation where my disdain for someone else, even if it is somewhat justified to be reinforced. If you have someone you don't like, find a way to help them. But I don't like them. Well, does that have to be fixed? Do I have to not like them forever? Moreover, am I supposed to not like them? How could I not like another human being, one of God's creations? But they're a sinner, so what? Why can you hate the sin and love the sinner. I know that's somewhat of a cliche, but the idea is very powerful. If we're not going to reach out and embrace those that are not as morally upstanding, it's very likely that they're going to get into a pattern and that's, uh, that's going to be irrepresentable or, or irrectifiable. Moreover, if, if I'm just, justified, if I'm righteous, there's a tendency for me to say, I'm righteous, but look at those clowns. And it's almost ironic, the same day someone takes on a diet, the very same day they walk by the candy aisle and they start looking at, look at these people, look at them, right? There is a is an automatic kind of reflexive response to someone's own upgrading of their righteousness to start looking down and castigating and mentally reprimanding and feeling haughty and superior over those that do not have that same heightened level of growth. And that's why every step we take in any growth or development, we have to take a parallel step in humility as well. We have the upcoming holiday of Purim. And Purim, Talmud tells us, is a day of love. And all the mitzvahs of Purim surround love as well. So, for example, we have to give Mishloch Maros, which means gifts to our friends. Well, that's love of our fellow man. We have to read the Megillah, to read the story of salvation, that's the love of God. Uh, we have a special feast that we're supposed to conduct. Well, that's love of our body. You've got to throw your body a bone. And there's another strange mitzvah that we're told on the holiday of Purim that we have to undertake, and that is to get so drunk 
that we don't know the difference between Mordechai the righteous and Haman the wicked. And the question is, what's that? And the answer is, it's love of Haman. We have to find, if it's a day that's totally consumed of love, let's try to find a way to not look down at Haman. How do we love Haman? We have to get so drunk that we can't even notice the difference. We're, we're just we're totally <laughs> rolling on the floor, and that's possible for us to love even the sinners. Okay, let's continue here. There's a, another famous verse that tells us, wow, beautiful sentence. There's another verse that tells us that we have to distance ourselves from falsehood. And this is interesting here, where, for example, with regards to illicit sexual activity, the Torah says, do not come close to it. Here, with regards to falsehood, it extends even further, not only to not come close, but to actively distance yourself from falsehood. What this means is, is that every negative character has a redeeming quality. If someone has anger, anger is terrible. But when directed properly, it can be a very useful uh, asset in your spiritual life. Uh, someone has lust. Well, that could be very bad, but it could be very positive. You could build a tremendous legacy. And everything has kind of its proper medium. Falsehood has no redeeming qualities says the Talmud, the Hebrew word for falsehood is sheker. And you notice the way it's actually spelled, sheker ain't lowered line. It has no feet. The letters are all on one point. So if you just kind of let it stand there, it's going to topple over. The shin ends with a point. The kuf only has one leg. The resh only has one leg. Whereas MS Truth, both of them, they're all secure. They either have a whole leg kind of flat to stand on, or two legs, and that's upstanding. What this means is that falsehood has no redeeming qualities. There's nothing, there's no saving grace for falsehood, and therefore, says the Torah, you have to disavow it entirely. Next law is bribery, and the Torah declares bribery will disrupt free will. We learned about Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's heart being hardened, which is a limitation on his free will. Normally, if he was allowed to act on his own, he would have let the Jewish people go, says God, no. The free will is going to be curbed for whatever reason. Says the Torah over here, a judge who accepts bribery is disqualified to be a judge because the Torah declares that his heart is hardened. He is going to be skewed towards the people uh, who did the benefit, and therefore it's almost as if their free will is uh, being suspended. And that's essentially, then it goes into the laws of the three holidays, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. And it gives some laws that we've already seen before, Matzah, etc., Shabbos we learn about. And then the Parsha ends with going back to Sinai. And this is the narrative. And this is, I know this has been kind of very fast and rapid fire, but that's really the way it is, one law after another after another. And then it gives a, a very interesting narrative here where God starts talking about what's the plan now. We had the Ten Commandments, we had Sinai, where to now? And the plan essentially is to go straight to Israel. But there's a very strange idea here. In the verse 29, first God says in verse 28, I shall send a hornet swarm before you, and it'll drive away all the people. There's going to be some miraculous components to the Jewish people's conquest of Israel. But then it says over here, I shall not drive them away from you in a single year lest the land become desolate and the wild of the field multiply against you. And this is very counterintuitive. It's telling us is that the Jewish people's conquest of Israel, which seems to be pending, of course, that's going to change with what's going to happen in the immediate aftermath of this story, golden calf and other misdeeds. But right now the plan is to go right to Israel. Okay, let's, let's conquer the whole land. Let's do it right away. Says God, no. I will gradually, slowly move the local inhabitants of the land, move them out really slowly. And you'll say, well, I don't want them to be slowly here. I want to have my enemies moved. Says the Torah, no, because if you do that, you're going to have instability. And this, I think, is a very powerful lesson, broadly speaking, as well. Sometimes bad things happen to us. We have enemies all around us, and it's taken so long to get rid of them. But there's always a silver lining if you look for it. 
And you think about it. Jewish people going to the land of Israel, let's conquer it overnight. Wouldn't that be great? Says God, no, no, no. That's actually not so great. It's much better for you to have gradual change so that's more likely to withstand the tests and the tribulations that are going to be invariably resultant from this transformation. I think it's a very powerful lesson for us. Broadly, when bad things happen to us, very often there's actually a silver lining around it. I'll just give a modern, uh, one of my unpopular opinions. Uh, on top of Temple Mount, built in the year 691, there's an edifice known as the Dome of the Rock. And it's actually covering the most sacred spot in all of Dury. It's not the Kotel, it's the Temple Mount. And you think about this, uh, how is it possible? You know, we capture the land, the, the 70 years almost, the state of Israel has been extant, and we don't even have our holiest spot. And I think there's actually a very positive silver lining as a result. What would happen if Israel seized Temple Mount, which by the way they did for a few hours in 1967, as an aside, if they seized it, it's very likely that the holiest, most sacrosanct spot of all Jewry will become a tourist site. The, the location of the future third temple of Israel will be defiled, unfortunately, by tourism, people taking pictures and people Snapchatting their way, look where I am, but now it's controlled by the Muslims, Jews are not really allowed to go there. It's terrible, but there is a positive side to it that it's being guarded, so to speak, by a contingency that's probably more likely to treat it in a way that's fitting for it, uh, you know, because of the conditions are not ready for us to take over. Uh, the Parsha ends here with a recapitulation with some more details of the Ten Commandments of the previous Parsha. Uh, there are some nice pledges that God makes to us. I would just read them because I think it's very powerful. Uh, God says, My angel shall go before you and bring you to the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Prusites, the Lissol, the, the, the Canaanites. Do not prostrate yourselves to their gods. Do not worship them. Do not act according to their practices. Smash their idols. Break their pillars. Worship Hashem your God. He will bless your bread and your waters and remove illness from your midst. What Torah is telling us is, God's making a pledge here. You uphold your commitment. He'll keep his side. Well, what does that include? There shall be no woman who loses her young or is infertile in your land. I shall fill the number of your days. I'll send my fear before you. I'll confound your enemies. Really powerful stuff. Uh, again, this is one of many uh, if, uh, if then, so to speak, statements in the Torah where God says, if you do this, I will respond in kind. Very powerful things for us to not forget. Uh, in, verse, in chapter 24, it begins, again, going all the way back to Sinai. It's almost as if the laws are bookended by episodes of, of laws. Uh, I'm sorry, by episodes of Sinai. It starts off with the Sinai of last week's parasha. It ends up with the Sinai of this week's parasha. Descriptions of the revelation. And in the middle, there are these laws. And you might think, perhaps, that the laws of interpersonal laws, well, they're not so important, right? How relevant are they? My ox, your ox, my stealing, your stealing. All these laws that seem to be very kind of simplistic. They're not so lofty. The Torah bookends them by description of Sinai, the greatest event in all of human history, one before, one after, for you to not forget that the way you behave and the way you behave not with God, with other people, that is something that is befitting to be told in between descriptions of the most monumentous event in all of human history. So it describes what happens, and Moshe wrote down the Torah. Moshe starts writing over here the beginning of the Torah. Uh, remember, the written Torah was only finished at the end of Moshe's life, but it's written incrementally along the way. So here they're right up to this point. Uh, they uh, go and they describe what they saw. An interesting note here, it describes that what the vision that they had, and of course it's hard for us to understand what this even means, but the vision that they had uh, was one of brickwork, which is surprising. Why would they see brick? Why would the Torah mention they see that, that, that they, they saw at Sinai, they saw some vision that involves bricks? Rashi tells us what this means is, is that 
the Jewish people, they were just recently slaves. Slaves involved in brickworking. What the, the message that I was trying to send here is, you guys were brickworking for decades and centuries as enslaved in Egypt. You should know, I was with you. I suffered alongside you. One of the foundational elements of God's treatment of the Jewish people is that God empathizes with us. Talmud says, when some Jew is going through a hardship, almost as if God himself is suffering alongside of them. And lastly, the, the, the Parsha ends here with the description of the Jewish people's attitude towards Sinai. And it says... Uh, against the great men, a great men of the children of Israel, he did not stretch out his arm. They gazed at God, yet they ate and drank. What this means is that the level, the spiritual level of the nation at the foot of the mountain at Sinai was one that they were comfortable to eat and drink, which means it, they were so at home with the spiritual experience that they were taking, that they were partaking in, that they were even comfortable enough to eat and drink they were at ease, and their love of God triumphed their fear of God. The very first revelation that we've had in the book of Exodus was Moses by the burning bush. The first thing he did was cover his eyes out of fear. Here it seems like the, Jew, the, the Jewish people are being criticized that their fear that is more appropriate maybe for such an experience was overtaken, was superseded by their love, and they were at ease enough to eat or drink. And we see Moshe, his spiritual ascendancy and his prophecy never ceased and never slowed down, whereas the Jewish people, they had a tremendous, momentous uh, experience at Sinai, a transcendental level of prophecy, but they never reached that again. Whereas Moshe had the correct proportions, he was able to enjoy it, to, to embrace it, and to feel the love, so to speak, but also to not forget about the seriousness. And I think that, again, is another level, another uh, teaching which is applicable elsewhere in our life, that we have to find this correct balance you know, of seriousness in relationships alongside love, seriousness in our commitments alongside our joy and our excitement of that. And the Parsha ends... A description of Moshe ascending the mountain. Again, the Torah is not necessarily chronological. This actually happened earlier, but the Torah will go off the chronological linear narrative to teach you lessons. Moshe ascended the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. Uh, there was the cloud there for six days. The appearance of the glory of Hashem was like a consuming fire on the mountain before the eyes of the children of Israel. Moshe arrived in the midst of the cloud and ascended the mountain. And Moshe was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, he's going to have a huge and undesirous surprise awaiting for him when he descends. But in the interim, we're going to learn about some of the lessons and some of the very valuable and critical teachings that he learned along the way and that inform and inspire for us from then, uh, from thenceforth. And I thank you all. anyone is interested, I have uh, four podcasts online. Uh, in fact, on January 19th of this year, my Jewish history podcast was ranked number one worldwide in iTunes uh, under Judaism. Uh, so if you're interested in Jewish history, check it out, rabbilobi.com. If you're interested in Parsha, something like this, both in Parsha every week as well, you'll find links as well for that on rabbilobi.com, along with lots of others, 458 podcasts and counting. And thank you all for coming.